All right, my name is Tim Laptino. I am the author of the book Art of Atari, and this talk is about me, a boy, and a book. But before I get into that, uh, I just want to tell a little bit about myself. I'm a graphic designer and creative director, and I often find myself, you know, whether I'm doing writing or design, find myself at the intersection of pop culture and design. You know, I've been part of the design community for nearly 20 years, but you know, I've been a video game guy just as long, if not longer. Um, and over my over my career, you know, as a professional designer, I've done a lot of work in branding and identity. You see a lot of this is some of the logo work that I've done over the years. You know, helping brands tell their stories via identity design. I also do packaging for food and beverage brands, right? So I spend a lot of time thinking about how do brands sit on the shelves and how do they communicate their stories. I uh, do print design, things like this. Uh, more print design. You guys are probably familiar with IM8 Bit out in Los Angeles. They're good friends of mine, and I've done some work with them over the years. Uh, and I also write and design books. This is my first book called Damn Good. Top designers discuss their all-time favorite projects. It's probably the, one of the longest and worst titles of a book, but uh, it was all about you know graphic design inspiration. Uh, and some of the other work that I've done, uh, you know, whether collaboratively or on my own, is you know there's video game inspiration all throughout the work. This is a book uh, that we did for for Sony and I made a bit about their game Hohokam, and it was a visual guide to, uh, to that particular game that came out on the PS4. But you can see, you know, like there's a thread running through all my work here. There's, you know, it has to do with video games. But so what, right? You know, okay, I'm a graphic designer. I love video games. I'm, that's not that unusual. But uh, video games are huge. You know, there's a there's a really interesting cultural moment right now. Um, video games influence things, everything from television to film to uh, technology. You know, what pushes the tech standards on new computers? It's video games. You know, how do people try and uh, you know come up with unique and interesting tech workarounds. It's, it's usually surrounding video games. But uh, there are really interesting lens with which to think about design, you know, which is you know, what I sort of eat, sleep, and breathe. Um, you know, video games have their own sort of visual language. They have their own sort of design tropes. They even have their, their own sort of dialect, right? And, and there's a, I think we can all say there's a subculture here. There's a, there's a style in that subculture. And so for, for those of us who've you know, grown up with retro games or even modern games, we're real familiar with those styles. But my professional career as a designer has really taught me to re-examine those games and look at it through the visual and creative lens that I do on a daily basis. So that's, that's the real interesting thing for me is how to look at video games through a, a design and creativity lens. Um, but you know, that's sort, of, that's sort of where I come from, right? But any way you slice this, however you want to think about the, the video game industry, you know, the industry itself in a lot of ways began with Atari, right? So this, this story has been told, uh, Leonard told it very well last night as well. The idea that you know, there's a little Silicon Valley startup you know, in the, in the 70s, the brainchild of, of two people, you know, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, right? They met at Ampex in 1968, and, you know, after a, after a while working together, uh, Nolan Bushnell convinced Ted Dabney to join him on this side project that they had been working on, and what came out of that was a, a game called Computer Space, right? And it, w it wasn't very successful, but it was successful enough to convince them uh, that there was something here and that they could strike out on their own. And eventually they took another Ampex alum, uh, Al Alcorn, and they formed Atari. So, you know, the, the big project that sort of put them on the map was something that started out as a technical test for Al. And it was turning, you know, this game called Pong. And it was super successful, and it really showed that video games could be profitable. You know, and there's a lot of other details, there's drama involved, you know, like any good story. There, there are a lot of other books and a lot of resources, things on the web that you can look into. I, that's not my focus today, because what I really want to do is dig into what happened after that, right? And how design and art really influenced Atari and really how it set the company up for success in a lot of ways. You know, so while Atari's doing all this stuff and creating these br breakout arcade cabinets, a breakout with a small b, like really in industry breakout, you know, the company had really set their sights on the living room. You know, they wanted to use programmable, removable game cartridges to bring video games into the home. You know, bring them into your living room where they could sell a single piece of hardware and then continually create new software at a much lower price 
point than the, than a lot of the earlier standalone consoles. So there's a there's some savvy business sense, and this is not my living room, unfortunately. This is awesome, but you know this was their target, and uh, so Atari drafted their concepts of what this thing would look like, what a, what a home console look like, and you can totally see right away that they're even in these early draft concepts. Uh, this is by Fred, uh, industrial designer Fred Thompson. Uh, they were searching for a visual language. They were trying to figure out how do we take this weird thing that no one really understands very well. You know, there haven't been many other uh, benchmarks for this. You have the Magnavox Odyssey, um, but that's about it. You know, they're looking for a visual language that this thing would fit into uh, a living room and not be scary. You know, because you think about it, at this point, people are still kind of nervous about video games. Parents are worried that it's going to turn their kids' brains into mush. You know, and they're concerned that, like, you know, is this thing going to break my television? There's a, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of fake news su surrounding this. And, uh, you know, so Atari's looking for something. In the original brief, the Atari VCS, the 2600, they, they said, we want something that's going to evoke the, the home stereo and home, home vi audio visual equipment. And so you can see sort of where we start getting to the familiar look and feel of the VCS here with this prototype and I think it's really interesting the joysticks are very different you look at there's a little housing for the cartridges the cartridges are a lot smaller uh, but eventually you know they settled on this right in 1977 uh, they sort of birthed this thing it's out there in the world and actually starts to become a little bit popular uh, you know it takes a while to get some traction but finally it becomes the 2600 the thing that we all know and uh, really changes the industry but you know, in that process, Atari realized that there was a challenge inherent in selling these games and marketing them and visualizing products that people really had never seen. You know, playing video games was still a pretty fresh thing, and there was no playbook on how to do this, right? And now, after their sale to Warner Communications, um, they were going to have to solve this problem using creativity, right? You know, the engineering was an assumption. The you know, Atari was always sort of, you know, founded on this great, in, you know, innovative engineering. But this was another problem altogether. It's one thing to build the thing. It's another thing to get people to understand it and communicate it in a way that's powerful and meaningful. Um, so the art of Atari. I think one of the things to think about with this art that the way I look at it is it was really a bridge from the experience of playing the game, you know, actually sitting down with your joystick and playing it, to uh, what you conjured in your imagination. You know, it was part of the story that you sort of absorbed before you even put that cartridge in the console. And I, th I think sometimes people who didn't grow up in this area look at this artwork and then look at the game and they say, that's false advertising. Be because, the, you know, there's such a disparity between this and this. <laughs> right? But, but it's not false advertising. That's not the case. It, this really was art that informed the gameplay. And, it, and coupling it with what was cutting-edge technology at the time, it made for an essential part of this overall video game experience. You know, you had no internet, you didn't really have video game magazines, you had you, the box, and the game, right? And those, all those things fit together in one singular experience. Um, so that was the ask of the Atari team, was to, how do we communicate and help tell some of that story, really give some excitement and emotion surrounding this game so that when people play it, the table's already set, the context is already there. You know, Atari really looked like a technology-driven organization, but at the core, I really think you can make a case that uh, the company was about creativity, in some ways design. You know, Atari was a place that really granted creative people, whatever way they were, whether they were artists or programmers or designers or even marketers, they gave them the freedom to take chances and solve problems in really unusual ways and sort of just let their imaginations go. You know, there was a lot of latitude and a lot of flexibility. You know, and I think whether it was, uh, you know, Nolan Bushnell or even the, the folks at Warner, they did one of those things that I think is really hard for large companies to do, is they got out of the way, you know, in a lot of ways. And, you, and that's why you see a lot of the really impressive products and, uh, and a lot of the art and design that we see. But, you know, being, being in the Atari fan community for years and years, I mean, I know a lot of the stories about programmers and about tight deadlines and whether it's Howard, Howard Warshaw and E.T. or you know, pa Todd Fry and Pac-Man, you know, the creativity wasn't just about the programming. It wasn't just about making the games. I mean, obviously, if those games aren't great, none of this other stuff works. But the creativity really cut across all parts of that company, from the art design to the programming to the marketing. You know, and we've, I think we, people in this room, you've heard the legends about 
you know, the rock star programmers, the hot tub parties. But I really wanted to focus on, you know, with my efforts in this book, the artists and the designers who have kind of been overlooked. You know, a lot of these other people, you know, we all know their names, but I wanted to write this book to sort of bring up the unsung heroes of art and design at Atari. And it really all began with the guy in the middle of this picture here, George Opperman. Not only did he design one of the most iconic corporate identities of the 20th century, you know, the Atari logo. You can still walk into a Target today and buy a t-shirt with the Atari logo. But he also really helped chart the creative course uh, for the company. And in the process, that really helped shape the, you know, this industry that ended up becoming this juggernaut. Uh, you know, and a lot of people don't know George Opp Opperman. You know, he wasn't well known. He tried to keep on the spotlight. And the fact that he, uh, you know, he passed away in the, er the mid-80s really contributes to the fact that we don't know him today. You know, not only in the design world, which he's, he's absolutely unheard of, but uh, also in video games. But he left an impressive body of work behind, and uh, he really was instrumental in sort of setting the tone for the art and design and everything that came out of Atari visually. And he was one of the, the main reasons why I wanted to tell this story, because you know, I'm an identity designer. I you know, eat, sleep, and breathe logos. And uh, this is one of my favorite logos, not just from an emotional perspective, but also just it's a great piece of corporate design. And I wanted to know, what was the story behind this thing? You know, who was the person that did this? You know, we hold up uh, the people, you know, people know who designed the Nike swoosh or the Apple rainbow logo, and there are books written on that, but not many people were talking about George Offerman, you know, in that same era. Um, so, you know, we don't know a ton about what went on behind the scenes, but I really tried to reconstruct some of that. Uh, but we do know that, you know, the, that Atari logo stood the test of time. You know, it doesn't, you don't need to be a video game person to know what that is. Um, you know, but there are some things we do know. You know, Opperman said in the press that his inspiration for this was Pong. The idea that you had a center line in Pong and you had two paddles on each side and that when the ball would bounce off of these things, it would sort of bend those paddles because of the force of the ball hitting them. And that was sort of his inspiration for creating this thing that also ends up being a stylized A. You know, so good logos work on multiple levels and oftentimes they have multiple interpretations and stories, which is why some people call this the Fuji. They say it looks like Mount Fuji. Some people say it looks like an A, but at least we know from the designer's mouth that that was sort of where his head is at. Now, here's a little secret. You know, a lot of times as designers, sometimes we work from a concept, sometimes we create something that looks cool, and then we sort of backfill the concept, say, oh, I was really thinking about this, you know, and which is not actually true. So we don't really know. We can't, we can't uh, ask George Opperman about that. but. Uh, but I've told you kind of what we do know. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see those are some of the initial concepts that uh, Opperman presented to Atari. Those are some of the things that did not make the cut. And uh, you kind of see where his head is at visually and where he was going with this, which is really fun. This was, my book was the first time anybody had seen that, you know, in public, which is pretty great. Uh, so George Opperman was a super talented guy. Not only was he a logo designer, um, he's also an illustrator and art director. And uh, for people in the industry, that is super rare to be kind of a triple threat in that way. Um, he really had the ability to tackle identity design for himself. So here's some of the logos that he did personally, you know, whether it was an arcade, home, or, or pinballs, you know, pinball games that Atari made. Uh, and this stuff definitely looks of its era. You know, you see a lot of multiple lines, you see a lot of bright color. Uh, so there's definitely a 70s, early 80s vibe to these. But uh, they're, they're great designs, you know, and, and I think they need to be, you know, celebrated in that way. Um, here's some of his illustration work. You know, here's the Airborne Avenger and uh, Missile Command. And Missile Command is one of my absolute favorite pieces. I, I think because there are a lot of illustrators who can render something really well. You know, it looks tight, it looks realistic, it has a great style to it. But some of them are not very good at designing space and sort of putting those illustrations in beautiful, pleasing, interesting ways that sort of guide your eye around the page. And George Opperman was a phenomenal designer in that way. So, you know, and I think you see that specifically in Missile Command. You see he's working on different, you know, he's using the technique of montage, but he's using different uh, planes of vision. You've got the missiles coming in and out of the space. You've got the people at the control panels. You've got the city in the background, and all those things meld together. It gives you this really, like, multi-layered, he's telling a story with this illustration and it really puts you in that place. It's not just illustrating a single scene. It's, it's almost like it's spreading out over time, which is cool. So, you know, like I said, George Opperman was a big influence in setting the tone, the creative tone at Atari. 
you know, they were a hardworking group and they were able to have a lot of fun. But you know, underneath the demands of you know deadlines and stuff, there really still was a freedom to uh, pursue great work and to pursue creativity. Uh, when I talked to Nolan about, you know, I interviewed him for this book, and he said, "Hey, you know, one of the hardest things to do as a manager of these people is to hire the right people and then get out of their way." And I think that's a, I think that's something you can really, you know, really give him kudos for that because that's hard to do. It's really easy to be Steve Jobs and you know micromanage and get you know get yourself in there and. You know, insert yourself into the process, but uh, Nolan didn't do that a lot. He really let the people run free, and they came up with some amazing stuff. So here you see, from left to right, you see Jim Arita, uh, Roger Hector, Steve Hendricks. There's George in the middle, Dalt Vanderwick, Bob Flamade, Evelyn Lim, who is uh, somebody I talked to a lot for this book, and then uh, J Jim Kelly. So, so like I said, you know, George Opperman being pretty obscure, you know, trying to un pack that mystery was one of the things that I wanted to do in writing this book I, you know, but I also want to know who are the people behind those pieces of art who did those drawings You know, I was a 5 year old kid and I just could not stop staring at the super breakout box and I wanted to know who were those people what did, how did they do this you know, why did they do this what were they thinking when they worked on those you know, and so that sort of floated around in the back of my mind for a while but it kind of happened in a crazy way. I'm going to tell that story in a minute, but I want to just walk through some of this art. And let me just say this, you know, we're working on this sort of widescreen view, so all of these pieces are cropped a little bit. And there's tons of great Atari art, but I really want to pick stuff that actually, you know, looked good in this sort of aspect ratio. Um, you know, and I think it's important to remember that this art isn't just about selling games. Obviously, that's a big part of it. These things sat on the shelves and they were meant to catch your eye, right? You know, they were meant to grab you and get you to think about this. But uh, they were selling part of the, the gaming experience, you know, and, and these artists were inspired by things like, you know, an older, slightly older media that had more traction, like uh, paperback book covers and LPs and 8-tracks and movie posters. Um, so here, this is uh, 5200 Asteroids by Terry Hoff. Uh, this is Berserk for the 2600 by Hiro Kimura. And I, I love this piece, you know, it has this great depth to it. And you see down this corridor and it really gives you this sort of uh, claustrophobic view with this exploding robot right here, you know, right in your, right in your face, really. Here's the, the 2600 centipede by uh, Burrell Dickey. And the thing I love about this, he's also using three-dimensional space. You see this, the centipede, you know, sort of splitting and moving around your field of vision. So part of it is right there, but then it's sort of receding into the background and it really draws you into the scene. You got Crazy Climber here, it was also by Hiro Kimura. Uh, Dig Dug, Gus Allen had a, a real talent for sort of bringing this sort of animated quality to these characters, you know, at a time when that really wasn't that popular. You know, you're thinking about the late 70s and the early 80s montage and editorial illustration was of a certain style and he really brought an animation quality to this artwork which is really fun and it sort of changed the change the way they thought about these things. Uh, this is an alternate version of the 5200 Pac-Man artwork, and I love finding little gems like this. It's like, Pac-Man has eyelids, what? You know, like this is great. And you know, we don't really know exactly why the other piece was chosen instead of this one, but it's really cool to be able to see that they were, they were still figuring this out. You know, they were, there wasn't a clear roadmap, and they're trying to figure out, does, does Pac-Man have eyelids? I don't, you know, now he does, but you know, did he have eyelids in 1982? Uh, this is Randy Barrett's 2600 Phoenix art, you know, and this ended up even coming out as part of a poster in uh, Atari Age magazine. Uh, there's just a, you know, a real expressiveness to the paint, and it's, uh, it's beautiful. Um, the unreleased Real Sports Basketball, this was going to be the art for that piece. And oftentimes, the illustrators would be commissioned to art long before a game was done, right? Just to sort of, you know, because they wanted to promote some of these games, but also... It wasn't a one-to-one -to -one today where you're like, oh, they, the game artwork has to look just like the game because that wasn't possible. So it was really about, we're doing a basketball game. What's it like? I don't know. It's not done. It's basketball. So wh what are the things? How do you draw people into the sights and the sounds? You think about sneakers squeaking on the, uh, you know, the wood floor. And you think about you know, layups going up and the energy of these guys you know, shooting free throws. And that's what they really try to capture in these pieces. And, and that's, you sort of mentally map that on to that game you're playing, even though there's two guys on the screen and one ball that's not even round, right? And that's our 2600 game. Here's another great uh, manual illustration that, that never got used for uh, the 5200 version of Vanguard. 
And uh, this, you can clearly see there's a little bit of a Tron inspiration going on here. You know, these guys were pulling from all kinds of things that were popular at the time, you know, and they really felt the freedom to sort of invent this visual language because none of these games had, had their own established language. And I think that's, for me, that's one of the biggest things that's different about uh, just really the licensing world as well in art today. You have a video game, you're making a, a Halo box, you're going to work right from the Halo art. And that company has a established set of key art, that's what you're going to use. You've got a certain logo you're going to use because that's how you keep brand consistency. Well, those rules hadn't been invented really at this point. This was the Wild West, which is why you see crazy versions of Pac-Man and you see Vanguard looks different from platform to platform. And some people may be like, oh, that's weird, that, that's strange. But for me, I think that's really awesome. Like there was a like, creativity and there was sort of a, you could, if you could figure it out, you could do it mentality. And I think that's something that really draws me to this. Whereas we've really systematized you know everything they do now where it's like there's a certain way here we're gonna give you the key art use that don't change it too much this is how pac-man looks you know and I mean that's what happens when rules and structures get get put into this and but you know we're talking about a time when those rules didn't exist yet uh, some of you guys may know this uh, this art may look familiar this is from the 2600 version of Vanguard but uh, it has a little bit of a Star Wars vibe to it because it's done by Ralph McQuarrie who, who did a lot of the original concept artwork for the original Star Wars films. And his feel really, you know, shows through in those films. And if you look at this, does it kind of look like a, a hot cave? Do those sort of look like Imperial ships? They kind of do. You know, and Atari was able to go and, you know, they were like, hey, we should get somebody like Ralph McQuarrie. And somebody said, why don't we just get Ralph McQuarrie? You know, and everybody assumed that Ralph would be too busy to do this, but he was happy to do it and he was really excited to work on video games for, uh, you know, for one project. Uh, and then here's one other. This is Space Invaders for the 5200 by Bud Thon. And this is really cool because that's not my idea of what a Space Invader looks like. And it doesn't look like any of the other ones. But they were constantly trying to reinvent these as the games move through the different platforms and trying to refresh the visual look of this, which is super cool. That's a, that's a frightening illustration. Like, what is that thing? I don't know, but it's awesome. So you're like, hey, that's great, Tim. That's a lot of really cool art. But the question is, why would you want to put it in a book, right? You know, some of that stuff's floating out on, on, on the internet. You know, but for me, I, I wanted to get my questions answered. You know, who was George Opperman? Who were these artists and designers? What was Atari like? And where did all that artwork go? And, so, you know, I, I found myself being pulled into this thing, and I started feeling like it was this Indiana Jones kind of quest, where I actually did end up digging up the, the artist who drew Indiana Jones for a box art. But it was a huge project, and for me, it actually ended up spanning almost six years. So, you know, the end result is this coffee table book, and it's a coffee table book on my coffee table. Um, but it all started with this blog post, right? Uh, I owned a design firm uh, for six years with uh, my partner out in Los Angeles called Hexanine. And one of the things when you run your own business, you kind of get to do what you want. So I, I'm a writer, I like to write. And uh, I said, hey, you know, this was, this was around uh, Thanksgiving in 2010. And I really, w I said, Let, let's, let's do something that's kind of Thanksgiving themed. So I, we wrote a, a story about who are, the, who are the designers and artists that we were thankful for, right? So I wrote this, this is 2010, and I had people in there like Sid Mead, uh, George Opperman, because at least I knew his name and some of his work, and Steve Hendricks, who also did some artwork for Atari, as well as Cliff Spahn, who did a lot of the original 2600 art. And it was two years later, I got a, you know, completely forgotten about the story, I got a comment on the story from somebody who knew Cliff Spahn, who she lived down the street from him, and he's one of the original Atari artists. So, you know, I was absolutely floored. I couldn't believe it. It was two years later. You know, I ended up, she ended up connecting me with Cliff, and we had this amazing conversation. We were on the phone for like an hour and a half. You know, and I think he was surprised that anybody wanted to talk to him about this artwork. But I was asking him, what were you thinking when you did Super Breakout? What about, you know, combat? And we had this great conversation, and he had such great recall. And he's like, well, I was really trying to move this here. I wanted to use this element to pull you through space. He had this amazing, amazing recall about all of these different pieces of art that I grew up with. And I hung up the phone and I was like, this could be a really cool book. You know, and if I would have talked to somebody else who were like, yeah, I did some art a while back, uh, it was cool. Like I probably would have hung up the phone and been like, oh, that was kind of fun, but that's it. But Cl Cliff really kind of got the idea in my head that if, if there are artists who could talk about this work in an interesting way, we could do a book about that. But there's a huge question. What about the art? You can't do an art book without the art. 
right? So the next big step was finding that art. And the first find came around, came about the same time as I talked to Cliff, was I, I was able to buy a, a bunch of 100 transparencies and slides of original Atari artwork. Now, for you guys who are not like in that world, back in the day, an artist would actually create a painting, and then they'd, they'd hand it off to a photographer who would shoot it flat. You know, they'd, they'd light it correctly, they'd shoot it flat, and they'd put it on this either slide or transparency film. And then they could send that film to a printer, and that's how they, they would reproduce it. So the printer would use that with an optical camera, and they would shoot it, and that's how they could print it, and they'd have a, a file that they could use to make film, to make actually a printer. So those slides and transparencies are like gold, because today we have awesome technology. I don't need to send it off to an optical printer. I have a, a super nice scanner, and I can scan these slides and these four by five transparencies and it's like scanning, you know, when they want to create something for Blu-ray, they want to create a new movie on Blu-ray, they'll actually scan the 35 millimeter uh, film. And film is so dense because it's a photographic medium that you can scan it at super high resolution, 2K, 4K, 8K. There's so much information there. So we can scan these things, and if the photographs are taken well, you've got great, huge reproduction quality artwork. And the cool thing is, is they're like this big. So they're way smaller, and a lot more of them survive than the actual artwork. Right, so I was able to get a whole bunch of these, and this is from the or original like auction listing. This is all this stuff that I got, and I was just flipping out about it. And it was really interesting because I had a conversation with this guy on Atari Age a couple a year earlier, and he's like, "Yeah, I've got some Atari slides and stuff." And I was like, "Well, if you ever want to sell those, totally let me know." And crickets, I never heard anything again. And then uh, I was getting ready for to go to church on Easter morning with my wife and my uh, newborn daughter, and uh, he sent me a message. He's like, "Oh man, I totally forgot." Uh, I found all that stuff and I put it on eBay. And I was like, what? What did you do? And I was like, no. He's like, oh, don't worry. You could probably get it for pretty cheap if you bid on it. I'm like, that's not going to happen. And I, so, so I, you know, I was like, I need to, I, I need him to just close that auction. You know, and this maybe is not the coolest thing to do. But I was like, I need him to close that auction and I, I need to get that stuff. So, you know, I sort of got away from the computer. My wife's getting dressed. I'm like, honey, can I have a thousand dollars? You know, and my wife's like, for what, <laughs> right? But she's totally cool for her credit. You know, she could have put the kibosh on that right away and this book wouldn't have happened. But, uh, you know, I was able to acquire the stuff. Uh, it was super cool. But the really cool thing is there was some artwork in there, but the other neat thing is now I talked to one Atari artist and I actually had some Atari art. So every, every other person that I followed up with, I said, hey, I've talked to these people and I have some Atari art. And uh, it sort of snowballed from there. So you can see these are some of the four by five transparencies that I was able to acquire. You know, and these were totally used to, to get the uh, artwork in the book. Because the modern day Atari, they don't have any, they don't have hardly any archives. They have none of this art, there's none of the originals, they don't have any of this stuff. So if this book was gonna happen, uh, I had to find all this stuff myself, right? So this was a first huge puzzle of this, right? You know, and a lot of artists at the time, that's how they would shoot their work, they do the same thing. They'd have somebody shoot it, or they'd shoot it themselves, and they'd have it on four by five transparencies. So. Yeah, there's a question. Did you need Atari's permission to use that stuff? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the book is totally licensed. My publisher has acquired a license from Atari to reproduce all this stuff. You know, it, otherwise it's a non-starter. It, it wouldn't happen. When you're, when, you know, there's some fair use cases, but when you're showing all of the artwork in its totality and the Atari logo, you know, you need permission. So Atari didn't have the artwork, but they had the license. So we needed both of those things. Right, and it just happened, it worked out that I could do both. Um, so, so, you know, I started, I started driving and flying all around the country, looking for art, you know, connecting with collectors that I knew who had some of, some of the original art, talking to some people who had uh, actually jumped into dumpsters and uh, saved some of the stuff. You know, some of that was collectors, some of them were art, actual artists. When they heard that their stuff was being thrown away, they would come back at night and rescue it, because they didn't want to see this stuff just tossed. You know, I, I uh, met with a collector. Uh, actually, you know, I'll jump, jump ahead of myself here. Let me show you. I went to the, uh, the, the Strong Museum in Rochester. If you guys are, you know, it's not super, super far from here. If you're in the neighborhood, absolutely check it out. They have something called ICHEG, which is the International Center for the History of Electronic Gaming. That's a mouthful. Um, there. But they have an unbelievable, they have unbelievable exhibits. They have a great archive of stuff. And they were kind enough to let open the archives and let me go in there and photograph things and utilize some of the original art and other cool pieces that they had, which was great. Um, 
you know, I found I got I was able to get original engineering drawings, which was great by talking to some of the people who used to work at Atari. But I mean, our you know my sort of bastion was people's attics and their sheds. I mean, this is where this play, this stuff was. You know, oh, it's a it's a dusty box upstairs in the back in the back of a you know a desk drawer or something. Um, like I said, I went to Collectors. This is a piece of Cliff Spawn's original art from uh, one of the catalogs, this wizard piece. And this thing's huge. It's like almost, you know, three and a half feet long. It's gigantic, you know. So it was really cool to get to interact with some of the actual original art. But, I mean, this was, you know, they say it takes a village. I really had so much help with, uh, from so many people on this. Um, you know, here's a photographer who I've never even met, but... He was kind enough to photograph this uh, logo that George Offerman did for the 10th anniversary of Atari, and this thing's printed on Lucite. This was owned by the son of one of the employees of Atari. So there's all these people who were loved, you know, loved the idea of this and were totally willing to help out and really go above and beyond to, to make sure that we had as much as we could in this book. These pieces were from the private collection of a guy who salvaged them when one of Atari's offices closed. He was uh, starting his own company and he needed filing cabinets and he heard from a friend that they were, Atari was closing a location and they were selling filing cabinets for a dollar, like these really big tall filing cabinets. So he drove out there with a friend and it turned out that they were handing over these filing cabinets full of stuff. And the, the guys were dumping all the stuff and helping them move them and said, hey, you know what, these will be way lighter if we just throw all the stuff in that dumpster over there. And he's like, no, 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 don't. I'll just take them like they are. So he bought a dozen cabinets, and his friend bought six, right? And they took them home in these big trucks. And his friend eventually tossed all the stuff because he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. But he kept this stuff for 30 years, right? And uh, eventually, right before he uh, ended up uh, letting a museum acquire it, uh, he let me come in for one day and photograph it. And I was, the museum was okay with it. He was okay with it. So uh, I was on vacation with my wife on the West Coast, and I said, honey, you want to take a day trip? So we went out into the suburbs in California, I'm not going to say where, but uh, in his office, a little conference room filled with boxes. We had eight hours. He said, you can do this while my business is open. So we brought a scanner, brought a camera set up. My wife's seven months pregnant. Uh, she's standing there scanning things for eight hours. I'm photographing things, and it's hot in there. I'm sweating, you know, and I'm like, okay, we got to hurry, because there was hundreds and hundreds of pieces. I knew we couldn't, you know, get copies of everything. So I had to figure out what was the best stuff, what was something I... I've never seen before. What were things that I thought we would use? We ended up having tons and tons of stuff. But you know, it was an exhausting day, and my wife is my hero. She's awesome, you know. But you know, we got all this great stuff, and uh, and we were able to photograph a lot. Uh, so it was cool not to just find these pieces that you know showcase great art and great design, but even seeing little bits of insights and in, you know along the way about like how these employees would talk to each other about the work. You know, there's, here's a little handwritten notes on uh, a Japanese version for the you know Atari 2800, one of the versions of the games, and it's just little notes. I mean, this is you know there was no Slack, there's no email, so you know here's a note. Hey, just remember you got to do this. Can you fix this here? You know these things would get passed around on paper. And it's cool, we have a little bit of a record of that. Um, but this also requires, you know, I said I'm a graphic designer, a creative director, so I, I have the, the fun ability to be able to like sort of walk in multiple worlds. So we have all this hardware, we have all this, you know, we have games, we have boxes, we have computers, but we also needed to shoot some new photography for this because we didn't just want to shoot things the way they were shot in the 80s. This is a modern book. So we ended up photographing a lot of things, but also, showcasing it not just as product photography but saying hey you know what let's show off the industrial design of things like the Atari uh, 400 the Atari 800 it's beautiful industrial design and uh, getting to talk to the people who actually made some of those decisions was really really cool um, you know the designer of, uh, of this computer he, he could you know he called it the world's first laptop you know in quotes and he said because you know the goal was to put this thing on your lap while you're sitting in front of your TV you know, there was, a, there was a different mentality. They were figuring this thing out. He wanted it to be small. He wanted it to be not scary. He wanted it to be something that, you know, your kids could play with it. It's got a spill-proof membrane keyboard, which is absolutely horrible to type on. But if you, if you spilled your, uh, you know, your new Coke on it, you know, it wouldn't destroy it, you know, which is really cool. But, you know, it's those kinds of stories that, I, you know, I wanted to bring out because, you know, I work in the world of design, you know, and it's, it's cool to talk to designers. You know, Fred Thompson thought I was insane. He said, you know, no one has ever asked me about this stuff, you know. So it was really exciting to be able to get behind that and 
find out the origins of you know this iconic one bird button joystick or why does the Atari 2600 have wood grain on it like those are things that I wanted to know um, and you know preservation is a huge thing and I think people you know this weekend have already talked about this you know companies even today you know there has to be a financial incentive for them to save things right you know but you know in the 70s and 80s people weren't thinking this stuff would be around in 10 20 30 40 years so there was no preservation so not a lot of things have survived people thrown things away or they you know reuse things um, so my goal in just doing this book was having a record of this stuff so even if we didn't have the originals people could appreciate and enjoy this art and design but also I want to roll my sleeves and do a little preservation myself so like this is the box for the Atari 2700 it was a, a remote control controller version of the 2600 with brand new industrial design. It has these cool, you know, LED lights on it. It has a flip back case to hold these controllers. There were problems with the controllers. It, apparently, they would open up people's garage doors or they would get inter interference with each other, you know. And so they didn't end up working. But they made like 25, 30 of these. We're not sure exactly how many they've made, but it's a beautiful piece of design. It's worth telling the story. Uh, but not much of the other designs survived besides some of those consoles, very few of them. But uh, Matt Osborne, whose uh, father was a VP of sales at Atari, had saved the, the box art. They had designed a box, they had done a photo shoot that Matt, his son, as a little kid, was in the shoot. And uh, he had this rolled up, crumpled, kind of crappy looking piece of paper that was a proof for this box that never got made. So uh, we talked a lot about it. He lent it to me. I had a professionally drum scanned, and then we painstakingly photo retouched it for yeah I mean we must have spent 50 hours retouching this and then we had a professionally professionally printed into a box so this is what the box would have looked like um, and that's cool and that's kind of weird because it's we're recreating something that didn't totally exist but I also felt like this was a piece of something that had one foot in the grave and we wanted to pull it out and show them that like hey you know this is a really interesting design Evelyn Cito the designer did this and there's a whole bunch of people and there's this cool story about the son of one of the Atari executives in the photo shoot, you know, um, and and hey, Brown Electronics are awesome, you know. So like, I'm a fan of that. So we were able to do things like this because I wanted to make sure this was this would survive. And I there's two of these boxes, and I have one of them, um, you know. And obviously, we photographed it for the book, which is pretty cool. Uh, so you know, design. I talk about art, but there's also design. It was a huge part of Atari and them crafting that identity and really communicating with people like what Atari was about, you know, and and sort of showing people, hey, I've never bought a video game at retail. What was it like? This is Judy Richter and uh, Evelyn Cito, and this is them at Atari at different points, and they were really great. They came from corporate design. They were young, but they really knew design. There was no video game. Uh, industry so they came from other places and they said hey these are the best practices of art and design we're going to use consistent typography we're going to you know do great production we're going to think about color reproduction and all these things that designers think about and they had been thinking about for a long time but they applied that to Atari and Atari was willing to spend the, the money and the resources to get really good people on there you know you see here like the design is great you know it really supports the artwork the artwork is really the hero but you've got typography that's consistent and well done and beautiful. You know, it's of its era, um, but it's it's great and it really helped Atari stand out, especially as other uh, you know other competitors and even some imitators showed up because you knew the difference between an Atari product and something else, and that's good branding. Um, you know, and like I said, you know that illustration did have to play well with the design, and they had this very modern, understated design style that really put the the illustration as a uh, you know, the hero of these. So, and behind all this stuff is this really analog process. You know, I take this for granted as a designer today because I can, I can do the job of 10 people, you know, sitting at my laptop. Uh, you know, it's pre-press and retouching and uh, creating, you know, printing plates. All these things that used to require this huge analog process is back and forth of people actually drawing on things, you know, and now I can do it all without, you know, without ever touching a pen to paper. Uh, but it's really cool. It's, you think about this, it's a, this is a hand craft in the 70s and 80s. So like this is a paste stuff, and these are basically a, a set of instructions about how to use the camera ready artwork. And they've got things like, line this up with this. This should be this color and this size. And this is the artwork we use. And make sure to do this. And this has to be this percentage of red. I mean, there's a lot going on here. There's tons of instructions. You know, this is stuff that software does for us automatically today. 
but uh, it's it's really cool to get a sort of a view of what this looked like. I mean, there was a real craft. You could do this well, or you could do it badly. You know, and Atari did it really well. Um, and then there's other things like this. This is from Demons to Diamonds. These are little sprites from the ins inside of an illustration, you know, for the manual. These are cut out by hand. Like, if, if you look really closely, those are all on little pieces of, uh, of ruby lift and then paste it onto a transparent background. Those are cut out by hand. You can see the little knife marks. That's awesome. Like, that's super cool. Somebody spent, you know, a third of a day or a half a day cutting these things out until they were all square and they were all right. You know, there was no, let's just take a screenshot. This is your screenshot, guys. You know, and that's, that's super cool. You know, it's neat to see, like, there's real craft going on here. Um, you know, and you were making edits by hand. You know, here's Donkey Kong Jr. And this process was a lot slower. You know, and I think there's something cool about that because today, you know, we send something to the client. The client sends an email back in, you know, 30 minutes and, hey, can I have these revisions by the end of the day? That was not this process. You know, you had to end up sending things, FedExing. Maybe if you were special, you were going to get to fax something. You know, that was really fancy. Um, but this is an analog process that took a lot more time. And I think there was a little bit more respect for the craft because it was kind of this mysterious thing that artists did. You know, and clients were less likely to be like, Oh, you know, I have a, I have a nephew who you knows Photoshop. He could do that. You know, there was really a whole, you know, whole uh, industry of people who really knew what they were doing. Um, so, you know, I don't know if the, the clients at that time were any less demanding, but uh, you know, I don't think I think there was a little bit of respect for what they did. You know, and you can see it in, in all the work that goes into these pieces. Um, so for me, you know, I'm really interested in process. Uh, I really, I'm one of those people that I've watched the commentary on every DVD that I own. Because I really am curious about how do people make the creative decisions that, they, that show up you know, on screen or on a box. And for me, uh, you know, it's not just instructive, but it's, it's inspirational. It's neat to hear how people sort of work through the creative challenges and try and figure out this. So I, I really like illuminating the, the how-to and the, the stuff that others do. And that's a big part of this book is sort of like pull back the curtain on the work a little bit. I mean, you look at this, here's Checkers. You know, uh, this is the original sketch and then the final version by uh, Steve Hendricks. And, you know, first of all, you're like, okay, it's Checkers. But look at all the drama here. Look at all the cool things that are going on. There's, you know, there's this, this disapproving father. And is that, is that his daughter? Is this the guy who's going to challenge him for his kingdom? There's this implied sort of Game of Thrones kind of story going on here. You know, and it's just a suggestion of a story. But at the same time, that's enough to sort of pull you into this, rather than just being like, King me. You know, like, there's a really, really interesting story there. And, and there's enough that it lets you sort of, uh, you know, fill in the blanks with your imagination. But that's powerful and wonderful in a way that, you know, you don't have to spell everything out for people. Um, industrial design. I, I sort of touched on this before. But Atari did a great job, and they really broke ground at different points. Uh, just actually this weekend, Nolan Bushnell was... Uh, was posting pictures on Facebook of uh, this is the video music, you know, which is sort of the stereo product that you, it was a pass through and you plug your stereo into this and then this into your TV and it would do these crazy visualizations of your music based on the, you know, the amplitude and all that of the sound coming through it. And it was a total failure. Like they didn't, I mean, in terms of commercial, they didn't make much money on these. No, I think he's exaggerating. No one said, I, I, I'd be surprised if we sold a hundred. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's more than that. But, you know, but the cool thing is, is you can see the sort of the visual language developing. Uh, Fred Thompson designed this, and you can see him borrowing from home audio, you know, and from ham radio, and these things. You've got these great German, you know, high quality German knobs on there that come from the audio industry, and they're sort of borrowing things, and you, they're trying to figure this out. They're like, who else is doing things that are kind of like what we're doing, you know, and continue to take this. This is a, a prototype. This is a, a mock-up version of that same product. But you see it's got that flip down lid. This looks just like my uh, Zenith Allegro turntable that I have home from 1978. You know, I mean, it was very much of the moment. What do you see there? You see the great dials and toggles. You see wood grain. It's not a coincidence, you know, that some of these things showed up in the Atari 2600. And that's really cool. We get to see the process. These things didn't just fall out of the sky. You know, they're part of a creative process. Um, you know, computers. Atari really, in some ways, was on the cutting edge of home computers. You know, I was talking about this being a laptop. Um, but, you yeah, know, the, the goal here was this was supposed to be a not scary thing. You know, it was supposed to be something you felt like you could touch, you could grab it, it has, a, it has this texture to it, this pebble texture. It was, it was meant to not slip around on the floor if you had, a, you know, linoleum or something like that. It really, uh, 
it meant to be interacted with, and I think that's what they were shooting for, whether it's the 400 or the 800. You know, I mean, you see a lot of beige here, which I think is awesome. But uh, you know, you've got Atari really innovative. They had removable memory. They had labeled memory and cartridges, and inside you popped open the 800 here and told you where to put things. You know, it was very this user centeredness at a time when uh, that wasn't that wasn't assumed. You know, this this industry of industrial design, especially for personal electronics, is still relatively new. And it's cool to see, uh, you know, Atari doing some of those things. They were doing it when they were figuring, trying to figure out cabinet design. You know, early ergonomics. You know, some of these guys, these designers, couldn't even spell ergonomics. You know, it wasn't a thing. And uh, but they were really thinking about what were the needs at retail locations and arcades. What would you want to be able to do? And as arcades evolved, they changed as well. They realized that having individual cabinets for every arcade game didn't make a lot of financial sense. But also, what did uh, arcade owners want to do? They wanted to cram as many games in there as possible. So there was less emphasis on side art because these things were just going to be packed right next to each other. So then they started focusing on the marquees and the artwork on the front. And how do you make those attract panels look really nice? Um, you know, the fabrication methods, they were figuring this out. That's a plywood mock-up of the Star Wars cabinet on the left side there. That's one of the designers there. And so there was no standard here. So it was still the Wild West of design. But, you know, it, it really led to some cool, wild things. You know, and, you know, wireless RF controllers, brown plastic. I mean, come on, brown electronics. That is awesome, you know. But you also had prototypes like this for this all-in-one computer that was computer and video game system. This obviously never got made, but you see the thinking here, the idea that they wanted to have this closed system, you know, with tightly integrated hardware and software. Who's doing that now? Apple is, right? And that's how many years later? So in a lot of ways, Atari really was ahead of its time. Uh, so for me, you know, Atari's not just about nostalgia. It's not just about taking it back to childhood, but it's really trying to preserve this slice of art and design that just happened to come out of video games. So thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. But wait, I do have more. If you guys want to st stick around for just a minute. So that book is out there. You can buy it on Amazon. You know, it's on Bar Barnes & Noble, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I actually don't have any copies today, unfortunately. I have two copies of the poster book. Uh, so if somebody is interested in one of those, I do have those, and I'm happy to sign them. Uh, follow, me, follow up with me afterwards. If you want to get a signed copy, I can help hook you up give you my email address, that kind of stuff. But, uh, but that's not it for me in terms of like, Art of Atari was successful and we're doing other books. So you got, you know, some people may have already heard about this, but uh, I'm working with the, some of the same team at our publisher to do this book. This is Undisputed Street Fighter. And uh, we sort of like switched gears from company and really were looking at one whole gaming franchise from you know, 1987, the first Street Fighter game up until today. So we worked really closely with Capcom and dug into their archives, and we're producing a you know an art book, but it's also a history book, really talking about um, how the how the Street Fighter franchise developed and really in some ways how it helped kick off what we sort of know now as the modern uh, you know competitive gaming world, uh, and that's really cool. And I just want to throw in some pictures. This is a special edition. We have this deluxe edition that looks like the Street Fighter II arcade cabinet. It's got a, uh, you know, a die cut window, so you can see the title of it looks like a, the attract screen on the arcade game. But I, I worked with, the, so I'm not writing this book. I edited it and art directed it. I'm the, the series editor for a whole series that we're doing. But a friend of mine is a great writer and great journalist, Steve Hendershot wrote it. And then the designer, Jason Adam, who also designed Art of Atari, designed this piece. So here's just a couple of pages. You know, we talk about the history of the games. We also dig into the characters. You know, these characters have shown up on multiple games and multiple platforms in over decades. And how have the characters changed? You know, here's E-Honda. You know, and looking at, you know, what is the art and design and what is the thinking behind some of these characters that people really love? Um, you know, and then, of course, we did some research. You know, and there's Steve and I playing these games. And, uh, you know, and I'm horrible. He just, just kicks my butt all over the place. But, uh, you know, here's us at, you know, at the arcades. And here's us at home. We were playing the absolutely amazing and horrible um, Street Fighter 2010, which is an unbelievably badly, badly made because it's such a hard game. But it has some super cool artwork that goes with it, and there's some fun stories. So you know, we really tried to mine, you know, these different places and figure out, uh, you know, what else is there. You know, there were there were crazy cool uh, action figures. So here's me uh, setting up action figures to photograph in my studio. Um, 
So you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to sort of dig into, and uh, and that's fun. We're going to try and take a slightly different tack on that than Atari, but you know, if you guys are interested in this stuff, I would say you know check it out. Um, you know, and hopefully this fall we'll be announcing another book that's going to follow up with this. So, Undisputed Street Fighter will come out in November, and then we're going to do a follow up book that I'm not allowed to announce yet. But let's just. Yeah, I won't say anything else. I'm, I'm totally going to get in trouble if I say anything else. But anyway, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate the time.